Awesome. Thank you. All right. Welcome to Youth Counseling. This would be class number nine, and we are going to cover some more, um, four more topics tonight um, that are kind of big topic issues, and each of these uh, we do already have um, stuff that you can use in counseling for these, and that's, you know, um, so uh, I say that because when we, when we dealt with the last two s sessions, the gender and confusion, SSA, and those things, I don't have that curriculum done, but the um, uh, protocols for these are done, and so we'll cover that. And then um, <clears throat> for those that are watching live, um, we will not have class tomorrow night, but we will uh, finish this class on Saturday morning. We'll start at 8 a.m. and go to noon. So, all righty. Um, tonight, we are going to start dealing with the issue of suicide. And uh, this is obviously a big issue um, and the protocol that we use for this is uh, do thyself no harm, recovering lost hope. So in this, in this class, um, this hour here, we're going to um, look at this, explain how to use it, answer questions on that topic, and try and get a good grasp of that, that area. Now, this issue of suicide, it's obviously become a big big issue. There's a couple things you have to know before we get into the, the process, protocol process here, okay? One is that you should take, you should take the issue seriously because um, it can be devastating to a family, obviously. It's ending a life. That's serious. It's devastating to a family that where, you know, that, that loss takes place. Um, and it's also devastating if you were counseling someone and they end up committing suicide. That's devastating. Um, so it can be devastating for you. Um, now, it's important, though, that you understand that this is an area where a lot of manipulation takes place as well. And manipulation can be a serious issue here with suicide threats, okay? So it's important to distinguish when someone says, I'm going to commit suicide, and it's just a, a constant comment, a constant remark. Um, it's probable that it, it's, it's not serious in that circumstance. In other words, when they say it a lot. Um, I, I don't mean it's not serious. I mean, I don't mean that to say that to diminish the concern you should have. I, I mean, you need to really examine if it is, um, if if it's credible, if it's um, if if they're actually looking to commit suicide or they're just looking to manipulate. Why do I say that? Because a lot of times people who actually commit suicide don't talk about it until it's done. Okay. Um, the so it, it's it's um something that you know happens a lot as far as a threat though so how do you determine whether it's serious or manipulation well the first thing is is that you ask them if they have a plan and if they don't have a plan it's more likely to be manipulation okay well so you might say so you and you plan to commit suicide? Well, I'm thinking about it. Okay. Do you, do you have a plan if you were to do it? Well, I'm, I'm trying to think about that, right? Well, then they're not most likely um, at, a, at a critical juncture at that moment, okay? But um, if they've already thought out the plan and settled on a method, it's serious. It's very, very serious, okay? And you need to intervene if necessary even um, you need to have them committed um, and uh, um, put into um, uh, 
put into psychiatric um, uh, observation because you don't want them to commit suicide. You say, are we, are we for putting someone into psychiatric evaluation, won't they, observation, won't they give them drugs and all that? Yeah, and, and they'll still be alive. Mm-hmm. And that's what mattered most, okay? So if you feel like this is a very real possibility, um, then I, I would not hesitate to um, turn that in, okay? So the other thing is, is though, if it's serious enough um, that you're concerned, but not so serious that you think that they need to be committed for evaluation, then I would recommend that you write down a a promise that says, I won't commit suicide. I promise not to commit suicide Um, uh, and, and put a put a criteria there um, uh, for the neck, you know, for this length of time because of um, counseling, da, da, da. Um, I, I'm willing to allow, to give God the um, space to help me with my problems, you know, whatever you might write on something like that, and then have them sign it, okay? Like they're, they're making a commitment that they're going to, they're going to do the things that you're going to talk about in counseling. They're willing to let God have um, space to be able to to um, help them in that situation in their in their trauma in their circumstances, um, and and they they're committing not to commit suicide. It, it's it's at least um, a a barrier in the mind of you. You made a promise, okay. Um, I will tell you this, I had last year, was it last year? Maybe the maybe 22, I had a pastor call me. And one of the, a person they had been counseling with had um, told them that they were going to go get away for a week alone. They'd rented a cabin. They were just going to get away from everything. And... He was very concerned. He gave her the copy of the emotional pain book here. And when he gave it to her, he said, I want you to promise me that you'll read this book. And he wasn't thinking she was going to commit suicide. She, he just knew that she was. So she promised him she would read the book while she was gone. That was the promise he asked. And he said, read the book, do the exercises. And so she made the promise. She goes away. She comes back. And she tells him, um, "My, I had everything planned. I was going to commit suicide again. Never told anyone. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's not. Un- that's the more common reality. Okay. Um, so I was going to commit suicide. I have everything planned, but you gave me that book and made me promise. So I decided before I committed suicide, I would keep my promise to my pastor. I would read the book and do the exercises, and then I was going to kill myself. And while I was going through the book, God helped me with my problem." All right, so that um, that was huge. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, I have someone texting me about someone in the ER. Um, that was huge. Another pastor about a month later contacted me about a basically a similar thing. He had someone he felt was suicidal, just the way they were talking. He had him go through this book. And um, God spared, God got a hold of them, okay? And I know of at least three people who were planning to commit suicide that went through this book and didn't commit suicide and are doing well now, okay? So I I know that, you know, this one isn't on suicide, okay? But praise God, it was what she needed, okay? So these protocols will help people if they'll go through them, is my point. Um, And it's important to to consider that. So someone that you might say with someone that's, you feel like there's a serious issue and and you feel the need to write, you're going to make me a promise. Okay. And maybe that promise is that you're, we're going to, you'll work with me through this book and another book or something like that. You know, before you make any decisions, 
you know, you'll, you'll give God the space to, to help answer your problems, you know. And then have them sign it, okay? So, because as, as odd as it may seem, there's a lady there who literally was postponing her own suicide to keep a promise. People, people take promises seriously, okay? And so um, there's no guarantee, obviously, that someone won't do wrong. Uh, won't commit suicide, but you do everything you can to, to put barriers there. Okay. All right. So that all being said, let's um, let's dive into this book, and and um, I'm going to kind of walk through it. I know not everyone here has it. If you have a copy of it um, online, I would recommend you pull it out and um, look at it. Um, but uh, essentially, this book is two books in one. Okay. It starts off with um, the first chapter is about why, um, let's ask why is the title. Uh, And essentially, I cover the idea of why does someone actually commit suicide? And I believe that the reason they commit suicide is because they have lost hope. They they don't have hope that anything will get better. They don't have hope that that, um, things will change their circumstances or themselves or their relationships or whatever it is. And so they, they lose hope. And in losing hope, there is um, a sense of why would I bother to be here if there's no chance, there's no hope that anything's going to get better in my life. Mm-hmm. So the first chapter lays that groundwork of the issue of hope. And um, the the idea of what hope is and and so forth. Now, I interject after chapter one, an entire, the entire book of um, the um, preparation of the armor-plated life. And I'm not going to go through all of that here tonight because you've been through a class on spiritual warfare um, and uh, or should have been. Um, in the undergrad, in the master's program, but um, I want to explain why it's there in this in this um, chap in this way. Okay, um, the it, that would be this much of the book is the is the preparation of the armor plated life. So I believe that. The issue of suicide, the issue of someone losing hope, there's a very high likelihood that there's demonic influence in a person's life when they come to the place of deciding to take their own life. Okay, They've lost hope, but there is someone who wants to take away hope. I mean, it's not like we don't know that Satan wants to take away hope. Mm -hmm. And it's important for them to understand that, and it's also important for them to understand that just because they feel like they have thoughts about this doesn't mean that they're actually their thoughts. And we cover this a lot in the spiritual warfare course. But remember, we have two illustrations in the Bible of someone repeating words they thought were their own, but they were clearly the words of Satan. Okay? We have um, Job's wife who reiterated to Job exactly what Satan wanted him to do, curse God and die. And she said that, I believe, believing that it was her own thoughts. Okay, And Yet, at the same time, we know it was di- directly, distinctly the intentions of Satan. So, I don't believe there's any coincidence that Satan factors so prominently in every part of this story. And then she says to Job exactly what Satan wanted him to hear. Okay. Then we have in the New Testament, we have Peter. And Peter is listening to Jesus. Jesus is talking about his crucifixion, his resurrection. Peter rebukes him. And Jesus turns around and says, get thee behind me, Satan. He was clearly speaking the words of Satan. But Peter didn't realize he was speaking the words of Satan, I don't believe. I don't believe he thought this is what the devil would like him to hear. He just thought he had a thought. 
Okay, he, he, he interpreted what he heard in the spirit as, um, as his own thoughts, right? Remember that we are, we have a spirit, okay? And um, a lost person has a spirit. They, they're not alive to God, I understand that, but, they're, but they have a spirit. The spirit of man is clearly talked about in the scriptures. And in, the, in our, our spirit, okay, we hear spiritual voices. We hear the voices, the voice of the Holy Spirit. Um, we hear voices of demonic spirits. Um, it, in some ways, I think it's fair to say that we can um, hear and, and receive those those voices, the spirit voices, in the similar way to what we might consider our um, physical senses. Okay, um, but the problem is, is we don't we don't see in the spiritual realm, and we don't live in the spiritual realm most of the time in the sense of our the way that we process things. Okay, and so the average person struggles to know the difference between their own thoughts and the thoughts of you know, God and or demonic spirits, okay? Um, and, and so they hear things, they don't, and they just assume it's their thoughts, right? And I would say that demonic forces often, very often, speak in the first person, in my opinion, um, as if I, I should commit suicide, I should you know, kill myself. I'm no good. I'm worthless. I'm this and I'm that. And I'm not saying every negative thought a person has is demonic. I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm saying. But I certainly believe if we're talking to someone who is suicidal, who is making a lot of um, overtures toward that, that we certainly want to make sure and eliminate the potential that there's a, a spiritual um, area here that has been opened up and we and we make sure that they're not that that they are not focused or listening to the wrong voices okay and so that's why I put this in here I put it in here because I believe that it contributes distinctly to the problem for most people for most people and it needs to be addressed and dealt with. So I'm not going to go through it all, but I will say this, that the workbook is, is I believe, fairly easy. It's not complicated. Um, it's going to walk them through understanding their position in Christ, their identity in Christ, um, their purpose, which is a big thing. We'll address later on also. Um, their, and then closing access to demonic spirits that have been given, all right? And that'll be, um, uh, that's addressed in that also. And then, um, and then it gives uh, a process for how to do that. It also gives, I think there's five chapters in there on understanding the enemy. Um, and, and I go through that in particular. So um, that section, that first, really the first, section of the book is focused on dealing with potential spiritual roots to this issue of suicide. And I, th I really do believe that it's important as biblical counselors that we consider the spiritual as a, the significant portion of this. But, you know, I, I certainly... I don't believe the, that every problem is a spiritual problem because a cold isn't a spiritual problem. You know, a cancer is not a spiritual problem, but it can cause spiritual problems, right? It can cause us to be down. It can cause us to be depressed um, from the physical side, and then that can become a spiritual problem. But I do believe that by the time we are talking about suicide, okay, we're talking about a spiritual problem first. Okay, so... This is, this is something that needs to be um, addressed. And I say that even if there are physical contributing factors, 
it's a spiritual problem that would lead someone to um, the point of suicide. Okay, and so we want to um, we want to make sure that we um, ferret out any any um, demonic involvement, and we and we deal with that um, up front. Okay, are there any questions about that? All right, Carter, you have any questions? Yeah. No questions. Hey, we we um, we dedicated him Sunday, and as I was just talking about, I said, but you know, um, dedicating him, and he went <laughs> like this. Yeah, it was so. The timing was really impeccable too, and just the hand in the air, just like you know, it was great. Yeah, he was giving testimony. All right. Um, okay, so once we get past that, we get into chapter um, 16 here, um, or section 16. We start into what I call the thieves of hope. Now, what I did is I took um, all the different circumstances in the scriptures where someone um, either committed suicide or attempted or had a death wish, and I took all of those places and looked at what was the, the main issue that was being dealt with in, the, in that uh, place and, um, and deal with that issue here in these chapters, okay? So um, this is uh, um, the, the rest of the book is dealing with these particular um, things and the, it, it's um, uh, nine different um, things. It's from... from Chapter 16 to chapter 25, um, uh, is that, well, I guess that would be 10. Yeah. 10. <laughs> All right, Keith had to use his, his fingers to count to 10, so. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, so... They're not in it in order of significance in a sense of like, well, this is the most common to the least common. I don't want you to think of it that way. Um, I want you to think about it more along the lines of um, what's the biggest issue for the person you're dealing with. Okay, so what I would do in counseling um, is that I would list these off I, and I would talk about these 10 different areas, okay? And so the, these areas um, would be beginning with um, feeling insecurity, um, insecure about yourself, not, um, or lose, feeling like you're losing control of an area of your life. Then um, a loss of identity. I don't know who I am. I don't have, you know, maybe they, maybe they lost something that their identity was rooted in and they need to... And, and so they, as a result, they feel like they don't even have a personal identity. Um, loss of a sense of purpose. What am I supposed to do with my life? I have nothing to do with my life. And when we talk about young people, um, I would say that that's a fairly common issue. Identity and purpose um, is something that they struggle with. And knowing, you know, what is my life for? And a lot of times they don't see purpose for their life, and that's a big issue. Then um, feeling despised or shamed. This would go to the issue of bullying. Um, now, there's, there's a, you know, both of those have to do with how a person thinks others look at them, other, the opinion others have about them, and so that could be a very serious issue for a teenager. Uh, overcome with guilt. <laughs> is the next chapter, and we're going to go through these more specifically, but I'm, I'm explaining each of them for a reason here. So um, if they've done wrong and they, don't, they haven't got it right, maybe they haven't even told anyone they've done wrong, um, they might see themselves as worthless. Let's say, for instance, a young person who grew up in church and with, um, you know, parents that, you know, taught them, taught them how to behave, how to live, and, and morality and so forth, and then, then this person, maybe they 
they went out and had premarital sex. And they're overcome with guilt, but they don't want to tell their parents what they did. And in their mind, it's easier to kill myself than to have to tell my parents what I did. You know, So guilt can be um, a serious issue, um, not just in that scenario, but in right. many different scenarios, okay? Um, then, go ahead, use the microphone though. Is that one uh, that's kind of tied in with not necessarily social media, but but um, you know where people have somehow somehow convinced a kid to send pictures or whatever, and then um, it's almost like an extortion or yes, blackmailing. And, and that actually happens often. It's crazy how often that happens. There was a a kid recently here, even here in Oklahoma that they were on the news talking about that that had happened to he was he was like a either a junior or senior in high school christian kid um family was in church and they i mean they put out yeah. the whole story uh, just trying to raise awareness about it yeah and they the numbers on that um as far as the the flipping it, it's crazy how quickly that that they can do this now um what I mean by that is that someone who's who's evil like this, they'll get into chat rooms and they will, or, or a lot of times now on games, because games have chat rooms, um, your phone, on the phone, Bible apps, all kinds of places, and, they're, and they solicit in there. And so they'll start with something relatively innocent, like just, hey, you know, send me a picture of yourself. And not, not a dirty picture or anything, just a picture. Once they have that, that, that first bit, um, the threats, um, I looked up, I used your picture to find where you live. And if you don't do what I say, I'll kill your whole family. I'll do this, I'll do this, I'll do this. And um, the, the manipulation is super, super heavy. Um, the girl here, it was a, um, not long ago, that girl that was walk that disappeared at the map Dallas Mavericks game down there that's exactly what happened to her and they were threatening her family and they said when you go to this game you have to go here or else we'll kill your dad you know and so she went the way they found her she was in Oklahoma City um, when they found her just a couple days later that the family hired a private investigator and the only reason they found her is they had already created porn um, with her um, like abusive porn with her and posted it online and they were able to track them through that. And had they had that not happened, they may not have ever found her. Um, and, and it happened, they say, um, so when I was in, I was in Belize um, a few years ago and we ran into a couple that was there that worked with the Underground Railroad, which is a um, group primarily funded by the Mormon church but they focus on catching child predators. Um, and they were there because the Belize government, that region up there, was going to shut down funding for their sex trafficking division because they said they just didn't really have any issues. They were there like um, three days at the point where I talked to them. They'd been there three days, and they... Um, and they had already, within three days, had had a dozen um, people that they they had already um, in, gotten, and one of them was a Disney executive. And um, uh, but it it's very very common. And so this guy, this guy, and this lady, as we were sitting there um, one evening, um, that we had run it, we ran into them. We went out to watch a sunset, and they were at the same pier. And so we we were talking there. Um, but they told me that eight minutes, that's, that's the length of time that they estimate it takes for someone who's skilled at this to entrap a kid and um, eight minutes. And see, this is why, see, parents think, well, you're supposed to trust your kids. Uh, you, uh, it's, it's, like, it, it's like saying, I trust my kid, I'm going to send him into a shooting gallery mm -hmm. and have him walk across the target range, you know, um, because... It, these these predators are so prevalent and we live in a wicked evil world and so um yeah that, like what you just said suicide and a lot of kids will commit suicide when they think i've messed i've messed up so much my family's going to die I, i'm just going to kill myself 
or or I, I'm going to be shamed when this comes out, and I'm going to, you know, and so it's unfortunate. Um, it's very, very unfortunate, but it's very, very common in our day, okay? So this issue of shame. Do you think, do you think that the issue is going to get worse with the use of AI now? Yes. Matter of fact, I, I fully expect, and I, I know this, as a pastor, I have people make accusations about me mm. regularly, okay? I'm talking about people that have left the church, people that, have, that are under church discipline or various things like that, that, you know, they, they were caught in sin. They always accuse you of the sin they're committing, you know? Mm. Um, and uh, it's, I, I have had that thought recently that I really do expect there to be some AI type thing of, and here's what my thought has been, of me saying something as if I were saying it in the pulpit or something that, you know, isn't real. Yeah. Um, because they literally can create these and nobody, you can't tell. They're deep fakes. They're pictures. Yeah. Yes. And, um, you know, um, so I have thought that whether it's me or another preacher or maybe a bunch of preachers, that this, this is probably likely yeah. coming in the future, um, something that's going to have to be, um, that, that's going to come out. Uh, in, I say come out, but, I mean, someone's going to do something like this yeah. um, because sinful people do, do wicked things, you know. Um, and so, and maybe it wouldn't be in the pulpit, maybe it would be something else, but that was my thought was, you know, that, that they can create those. So there was something, I remember I saw the other day, this is what made me think of it. It was like supposedly um, someone talking and, and like literally I watched it. You could not have told, that. I couldn't tell that it wasn't the person. Mm -hmm. But it was, um, and that was the point of the post that I saw was that I that a person created this and it is completely fake, but it can't, you couldn't tell, the average person could not tell, you know. So um, audio, video, photographs, all that type of stuff can be, can be totally fake now. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you know? And, and the, the craziest part is, is it just takes an accusation. Um, it only takes an accusation. You add it to, to really cause so much damage. Now add to it something like that, and and oh my goodness, you could be, you could you could destroy ministries. Uh, and, and, and I hate to even say that because I, w I wouldn't want to put the idea in someone's mind. But we're in a private class here. But um, but the reality is, is I guarantee the idea is out there. Oh, yeah. Guarantee the idea is out there. So anyway, yep. Eric, kind of reminds me of those uh, misinformation posts during uh, I feel like it's been a couple of years ago now but like where it would be like a story on Facebook with a with an image and the words were on top of an image and then you get down to the bottom and it was like I can't believe you believed what it is yeah. but just you know we do have a tendency to with all the different things that are thrown out at us we read an article it's like wow you know um and and have a tendency to just automatically believe I something I don't think I don't think anybody is safe at this point in this world yeah I don't think anybody's safe well, I mean, yeah, kids, but I, I'm just saying with the ability to fake everything, mm -hmm. nobody's safe. It's it's really crazy. It, 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 it goes back to two nights ago when we were talking about truth. What is truth? And when there's so much misinformation, then it, it just is like, well, you have to determine yourself what you're going to trust right. because there's so many lies and there's so exactly. many misinformation out there. Yep, Absolutely. All right, so um, the last couple of these are um, feelings of failure or being blinded by darkness. Um, a person can get into the point where they're just so so overwhelmed with the dark feelings, dark thoughts, and so forth. Um, they don't see any way out, and so uh, suicide can be a result of that. Prolonged sickness and trial. Um, chronic illness, you know, 
um, yeah, um, for, uh, um, what do they call it, um, terminal diseases, but there, there are diseases that are terminal, but then also they're incredibly painful and, and whatnot. Um, being threatened or bullied, and then depression, and then also um, bitterness. So those are the 10 areas that are covered here. We obviously, we're not going to go into each of them, but I want to kind of um, lay out how the book works. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to turn to one and I'll just, uh, this is at random. So feeling despised or shamed is chapter 19. So what I do is I, I, I write about that. Um, I give a Bible illustration. Okay. In this particular one, and I'm just going to focus on the illustration. There was a man with a strange name in the old Testament of Ahipothel, who is a counselor to a man who wanted to be king. That would be Absalom. Ahipothel's counsel was considered to be so good that it says in 2 Samuel 16, 23, the counsel of Ahipothel, which he counseled in those days, was as if a man had inquired at the oracle of God. So was all the counsel of Ahipothel, both with David and with Absalom. And so the word oracle means the very word that is to say, as if they had heard from God himself. One day Ahipophel gave his counsel and the king decided to accept the advice of someone else instead. Ahipophel's pride was so wounded that in 2 Samuel 17, 23, that he left and killed himself. Sometimes we let our pride become so large that we think we are being personally rejected when other people don't accept our opinion. Uh, Proverbs 11.2 says, When pride cometh, then cometh shame, but with the lowly is wisdom. We can take up offense against others that led, lead to great bitterness or such as in the, this man's case lead us to consider death rather than being shamed in front of others. The feeling of shame is something that no one likes, but when it drives us to consider killing ourselves, it's an indication that the pride has gotten out of hand. The Bible tells us that Jesus despised the shame of the cross, redeemed us. He knew... He knows how to deal with shame and reproach, and He can help you through this problem as well. So then that Bible illustration then leads into how to deal with the particular topic, okay? Um, and then often at the end, I'll put in questions, exercises, those type of things. So here... Um, Questions: What things from this chapter do you need to implement in your life right now to begin dealing to deal with this issue? What's the first step that you'll take now to start gaining victory? Please share this with someone you know so that you have accountability to help make these changes. So, um, the the um, point being here and, and this discussion of how we would use this then. In talking to the individual, I, I would not just hand this book out to people and say, hey, you know, hey, you kind of seem suicidal. Here, read that, you know. <laughs> I don't have time to talk to you. This is one of those areas that, you know, you're going to talk to them. You're going to, in counseling, you're here. You're going to know probably whether they need to deal with spiritual warfare, okay? Um, it's all in here for that reason, um, but... Um, then also you're going to, you know, in, in counseling, you're going to try and refine down what are the primary roots that they feel this way. And it may be, and my experience is, is that there's more than one usually. Um, it's, it's not, I've never had anyone have all 10 of these. Usually, though, um, one to three areas that are kind of prominent. Um, and, uh, and, and so we might deal with, with, um, you know, three areas out of this. And then what I'll do is I'll say, you know, while we're, while we're doing this, let's just go ahead and go through the rest of the book. But I will target where we need to go. So I won't start it. I generally have them go through chapter one because it's about why it lays the groundwork for the idea of loss of hope and that being the root issue here. And then we'll jump to whichever section, if it's spiritual warfare, if it's, you know, one of the other chapters, we'll jump to that chapter and we'll, we'll um, kind of focus on that topic. And 
<laughs> and then you know work our way. So this is more of a, a drop in where you need to type protocol. And then I'll go back after we. I feel like we've dealt with those primary areas. Then I'll go back and say, now let's go ahead and go through those parts we didn't go through. Okay. Are there questions about that? I have had someone commit suicide. Um, not while I was counseling them. They they were military. Um, they were actually one of the first couple people I counseled when I was doing my practicum. Met with them like five times. Um, and then they got transferred away. And about a year and a half later, they committed suicide. So I, we weren't done counseling. We had just really gotten started. Um, it's important you keep your notes because I, I was contacted by NCIS, which I thought was just a television show. <laughs> Turns out it's an actual actual um, deal and so um, they sent me a release of information um, form and I sent them my notes they contacted me back and said you know it's obvious you were trying to help him and just you know thank you for your attempt and um, you know so forth so but it was in his file that he was counseling with me that's how they reached out to me okay so um it is important to keep notes and uh, and that, but it's it's also important just it's important to have a sense of of this the the significance when we counsel that it is sometimes life and death, okay um, and um, you know there are there's been a couple times in counseling over the years where I have felt like this person's on the verge of suicide if we don't don't deal with this. I mean, some serious things. Generally, they not, those are the ones that have not said, I'm going to commit suicide. But in questioning, it's it's been clear, right? Um, and then also, I've had many, many who used the threat of suicide as a manipulation technique. And um, that's way more common in my, in my own counseling experience, okay? Um, how do you deal with manipulate, manipulators? Well, we'll talk about that in another session, but um, it's important to recognize that you have to call a manipulator. We'll, we'll get into that more in a, in a little bit. Um, but um, the, the um, this is a serious topic that needs to be addressed in that way, okay? So questions about anything about this topic. Have you ever had to do the, you said like do the institution, have you ever had to do that and is that a, like a more common than? I've never had to get to it. I have threatened it. Oh, okay. Um, I had a person who it was like they just were not, and, and they, I believe they were more serious. And that's why I, I got to that point. I said, Look, and they weren't doing the work. They were just being very resistant. It was an intensive counseling scenario. And um, and then finally it was like, I'm, I, this doesn't work. I'm, I'm done. I'm going to kill myself. And it was a very serious moment. And I said, I believe you. Um, so I'm going to call right now. I'm, I'm going to call um, the um, psychiatric hospital in Norman. And um, they're either going to come get you or your husband and I are going to take you down there and um, we're going to have you committed. You wouldn't do that. You're a preacher. You don't believe in that stuff. Oh, I believe in saving life. Mm -hmm. I believe in saving your life. And uh, they'll, they will medicate you, but they will prevent you from committing suicide and, until you come to your senses and, um, and start being willing to discuss things. I don't believe you. I said, well, I, it doesn't matter if you believe me. I'm getting ready to dial. I pull, pulled out my phone, and I looked up and I looked up the number. And um, it, it was like it snapped the, you're serious. Like, you're really serious. You're going to do this. And it changed. That, that changed the, 
flow of the of the counseling, and we were able to deal with a lot of things from that point forward. But they had been very obstinate to dealing with things up to that point. Um, that's not uncommon, especially with young people. Like they don't want to, they didn't want to come for counseling and put on their PDI. Why are, why are you coming for counseling? My parents are making me. You know, they don't want to do it. And so, um, you know, it's not. That's not an uncommon thing under those type of circumstances. And so, um, I, I definitely say, would I do it? Yes, I would. I would. A hundred percent, I would. But. Um, if you, if someone hasn't said, I think I'm thinking about killing myself, but you have that thought, I, I think they're suicidal. Do you tell them that or do you? I, I ask, I never tell someone that. I ask questions to reveal. Yeah. So you, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you're just going to ask enough questions, enough questions that you're going to know. Yeah. 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 It's important not to tell as much. The tendency in counseling is to, to resort to lecture. Um, that's the same with most everything we do. And counseling needs to, you know, the Bible says a man of understanding draws it out. Okay. That the way you draw things out is through conversation and questions. And it's important to be patient with that process. And most of us aren't very patient with that process. We, we see something, we're like, here's the problem, you know, pull out the Bible hammer and smash him in the head with it, you know. Um, and so, but then what happens is you get resistance. Like, they're, well, that's not my problem. You're, you're not right. You're not right. I'm not, that's not me. That's not, you know. So being patient enough to ask enough questions until they say it themselves is one of the biggest keys in counseling and specifically in this area, okay? Um, is I, if I suspect it, I'm just gonna ask questions. I'm gonna ask questions all around and through and up and down and, um, and I'm gonna listen. And, and my, my questions are gonna be in many ways driven by what they say, obviously. So, you know, a good counselor becomes a great question asker. All right. Not why. You don't ask why. You need to take. You need to. I don't know what. I have to look back on what. You need to take the discernment class. The discernment class. We get deep into that topic. So, all right. Okay. Uh, let's take a, a break here uh, for 10 minutes, and then we will start back up.